Hi, everybody. Welcome back to episode number three of The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And today we're on section three called The Lover's Errand. If you remember last time, we left it with John Alden is getting ready to go see Priscilla and ask Priscilla if she will marry Miles Standish, even though John is in love with her. I wonder what she's going to say. So let's find out. Section three is titled again, The Lover's Errand. Let's see what happens. So the strong will prevailed and Alden went on his errand out of the street of the village and into the paths of the forest, into the tranquil woods where bluebirds and robins were building towns in the populous trees with hanging gardens of verdure, peaceful aerial cities of joy and affection and freedom. All around him was calm, but within him commotion and conflict, love contending with friendship and self with each generous impulse. To and fro in his breast, his thoughts were heaving and dashing as, a found, as in a foundering ship with every roll of the vessel washes the bitter sea, the merciless surge of the ocean. Must I relinquish it all, he cried with a wild lamentation. Must I relinquish it all, the joy, the hope, the illusion? Was it for this I have loved and waited and worshipped in silence? Was it for this I have followed the flying feet and the shadow over the wintry sea to the desolate shores of New England? Truly the heart is deceitful, and out of its depths corruption rise, like an exhalation, the misty phantoms of passion. Angels of light they seem, but are only delusions of Satan. All is clear to me now. I feel it. I see it distinctly. This is the hand of the Lord. It is laid upon me in anger, for I have followed too much the heart's desires and devices, worshipping Ashtaroth blindly and impious idols of Baal. This is the cross I must bear, the sin and the swift ret retribution. So through the Plymouth woods John Aldrin went on his errand, crossing the brook at the ford where it brawled over pebble and shadow, gathering still as he went the mayflowers blooming around him, fragrant, filling the air with strange and wonderful sweetness, children lost in the woods and covered with leaves in their slumber. Puritan flowers, he said, and the type of Puritan maidens, modest and simple and sweet, the very type of Priscilla. So I will take them to her, to Priscilla, the Mayflower of Plymouth, modest and simple and sweet as a parting gift will I take them, breathing their silent farewells as they fade and wither and perish, soon to be thrown away as is the heart of the giver. So through the Plymouth woods John Alden went on his errand, came to an open space and saw the disk of the ocean, sailless, somber, and cold, with the comfortless breath of the east wind, saw the new-built house and people at work in a meadow, heard as he drew near the door the musical voice of Priscilla, singing the hundredth psalm, the grand old Puritan anthem, music that Luther sang to the sacred words of the psalmist, full of the breath of the Lord, consoling and comforting many. Then, as he opened the door, he beheld the form of the maiden seated beside her wheel and the carded wool like a snowdrift, piled at her knee, her white hands feeding the ravenous spindle, while with her foot on the treadle she guided the wheel in its motion. Open wide on her lap lay the well-worn psalm book of Ainsworth, printed in Amsterdam, the words and the music together, rough-hewn, angular notes like stones in the wall of a churchyard, 
darkened and overhung by the running vine of the verses. Such was the book from whose pages she sang the old Puritan anthem, she, the Puritan girl, in the solitude of the forest, making the humble house and the modest apparel of homespun beautiful with her beauty, and rich with the wealth of her being. Over him rushed, like a wind that is keen and cold and relentless, thoughts of what might have been, and the weight and the woe of his errand, all the dreams that had faded and all the hopes that had vanished, all his life henceforth a dreary and tenantless mansion, haunted by vain regrets and pallid, sorrowful faces. Still, he said to himself, and almost fiercely he said it, Let not him that putteth his hand to the plough look backwards. Though the ploughshare cut through the flowers of life to its fountains, though it pass o'er the graves of the dead to the hearths of the living, it is the will of the Lord, and his mercy endureth forever. So he entered the house, and the hum of the will, wheel and the singing suddenly ceased, for Priscilla, aroused by his step on the threshold, rose as he entered and gave him her hand in the signal of welcome, saying, I knew it was you when I heard your step on the passage, for I was thinking of you as I sat there singing and spinning. Awkward and dumb with delight that a thought of him had been mingled thus in the sacred psalm that came from the heart of the maiden, Silent before her he stood and gave her the flowers for an answer, finding no words for his thought. He remembered that day in the winter, after the first great snow, when he broke a path from the village, reeling and plunging along the drifts that encumbered the doorway, stamping the snow from his feet as he entered the house, and Priscilla laughed at his snowy locks and gave him a seat by the fireside, grateful and pleased to know that he had thought of her in the snowstorm. Had he but spoken then, perhaps not in vain had he spoken. Now it was all too late. The golden moment had vanished. So he stood there abashed and gave her the flowers for an answer. Then they sat down and talked of the birds and the beautiful springtime, talked of their friends at home and the mayflower that sailed on the morrow. I have been thinking all day, said the gently the Puritan maiden, dreaming all night and thinking all day of the hedge hedgerows of England. They are in blossom now, and the country is all like a garden, thinking of lanes and fields and the song of the lark and the linnet, seeing the village street and the familiar faces of neighbors going about as of old and stopping to gossip together and at the end of the street the village church with the ivy climbing the old gray tower and the quiet graves in the churchyard kind are the people i live with and dear to me my religion still my heart is so sad that i wish myself back in old england you will say it is wrong, but I cannot help it. I almost wish myself back in old England. I feel so lonely and wretched. Thereupon answered the youth, Indeed, I, I do not condemn you. Stouter hearts than a woman's have quailed in this terrible winter. Yours is tender and trusting and needs a stronger to lean on. So I've come to you now, with an offer and a proffer of marriage uh, made by a good man and true Miles Standish, of Cap the captain of Plymouth. Thus he delivered his message. The dexterous writer of le letters did not embellish the theme, nor array it in beautiful phrases, but came straight to the point and blurted it out like a schoolboy. Even the captain himself could hardly have said it more bluntly. Mute with amazement and sorrow, Priscilla the Puritan maiden looked into Alden's face, her eyes dilated with wonder, feeling his words like a blow that stunned her and rendered her speechless, till at length she exclaimed, interrupting the ominous silence, "'If the great captain of Plymouth is so very eager to wed me, why does he not come himself and take the trouble to woo me?' 
if I am not worth the wooing, I surely am not worth the winning. Then John Alden began explaining and smoothing the matter, making it worse as he went, by saying the captain was busy, had no time for such things, such things. The words grating harshly fell on the ear of Priscilla, and swift as a flash she made answer. "'Has no time for such things, as you call it, before he is married. "'Would he be likely to find it or make it after the wedding? "'That is the way with you men. "'You don't understand us. "'You cannot, when you have made your minds, "'after thinking this one and that one, "'choosing, selecting, rejecting, comparing one with another, "'then you make known your desire with abrupt and sudden avowal "'and are offended.' and hurt, and indignant, perhaps, that a woman does not respond at once to a love that she never suspected, does not attain at a bound the height to which you have been climbing. This is not right, nor just, for surely a woman's affection is not a thing to be asked for, and had for only the asking. When one is truly in love, one not only says it, but shows it, Had he but waited a while, had he only showed that he loved me, even this captain of yours, who knows, at last might have won me, old and rough as he is, but now it can never happen. Still, John Alden went on, unheeding the words of Priscilla, urging the suit of his friend, explaining, persuading, expanding, spoke of his courage and skill and of all his battles in Flanders, how with the people of God he had chosen to suffer affliction, how in return for his zeal they had made him captain of Plymouth. He was a gentleman born, could trace his pedigree plainly, back to Hugh Standish Standish of Duxbury Hall in Lancashire, England who was the son of Ralph, the grandson of Thurston de Standish, heir unto vast estates, of which he was basely defrauded, still bore the family arms, and had for his crest a cock argent combed with wattled ghouls, and all the rest of the blazon. He was a man of honor, of noble and generous nature. Though he was rough, he, he was kindly. She knew how during the winter he had attended the sick, and with a hand as gentle as a woman's, somewhat hasty and hot, he could not deny it, and headstrong, stern as a soldier might be, but but hearty, and placable always, not to be laughed at and scorned because he was little of stature, for he was courageous of heart and magnanimous, courtly, courageous. Any woman in Plymouth, nay, any woman in England, might be happy and proud to be called the wife of Miles Standish. But as he warmed and glowed in his simple and eloquent language, quite forgetful of self and full of the praise of his rival, archly the maiden smiled, and with eyes overrunning with laughter said in a tremulous voice, Why don't you speak for yourself, John? Mm, she wants him to ask her to marry him. Marry him. Marry her. Okay, that's it for this time. I'll see you next time. Hey, and a quick hello to my very good friends, Zachary and Jonathan. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. See you next time.